Uh, my name's Jeremy Pritchard. I'm a professor of life sciences education at the University of Birmingham, and I also chair uh, the Royal Society of Biology Curriculum Committee and the Plant Health Advisory Group, which is overseeing a project between the Royal Society of Biology and DEFRA to, uh, to really invigorate uh, plant health sciences um, uh, to get the community networked and to broaden that network out. Obviously, at times like these with climate change and so on, this becomes uh, more important than ever. Uh, I'd like to mention one of the things that, that, that the group is, is driving forward, and that is the Plant Health Undergraduate Studentship Program. Uh, this is currently accepting applicants uh, from researchers, and you get money to host uh, a paid student internship for undergraduate students. And, and it's particularly good because it's for first and second year undergraduate studentships. And, and as some of you will know, they, they really benefit from uh, these type of opportunities and also broadening their, their, their aspects in terms of plant health. And I think Eleanor will have now shared the link to that uh, in, uh, in the chat. So if, you, if you're interested in that, uh, please, please apply. Uh, so um, we're um, we're going to hear in a moment from Nicola Spence uh, on on the uh, GB plant biosecurity strategy. Um, this is this is something that um, uh, for all of us involved in plant sciences is is really crucial at the moment, whether it's in education uh, or delivery. Um, this is the first of a satellite event that's part of this uh, collaboration between DEFRA and the Royal Society of Biology. Uh, the next one will be on the 21st of June, and this will be uh, in person uh, with a hybrid component. And I'm pleased to say it will be uh, at the University of Birmingham, which is where I'm uh, now sitting. Uh, so I hope to see some of you there um, uh, and, and to continue these discussions uh, uh, on over the next four years at least. So. Um, our guest speaker today, our plenary speaker today, is, is Professor Nicola Spence. She is uh, DEFRA's uh, Chief Plant Health Officer and advises the government, ministers and so on, uh, on, on what we should do about the, the, the risks that are coming down the line and exist already in terms of uh, plant health, pests, diseases and so on. Um, and Nicola has spoken at the university to our students and, and really invigorated them uh, in, in this area. She has a, a, a research background in plant pathology, working on virus diseases, uh, horticultural crops, both in the UK and internationally for, for over 20 years. Um, and she's a fellow of the Royal Society of Biology, honorary professor at the University of Birmingham, which is obviously good, good for me, uh, visiting professor at Harter Adams and a trustee of the Royal Horticultural Society, the Yorkshire Arboretum and so on. Uh, She's got a BSc in, uh, in Botany from Durham, an MSc in Microbiology from Birkbeck, and a PhD in Plant Virology from the University of Birmingham. So she's actually an alumnus uh, here as well. And her, just, just to, uh, to, to nail that down, her PhD was on the bean common mosaic virus in phaseolus beans, but giving it an international spin that was done uh, in Africa. Uh, and I advise you as well, those of you who are on social media, to follow her on Twitter as at Plant Chief, a very nice, short, uh, descriptive title of, of Nicola's events. And you get lots of good information and insight uh, to, to her work in the plant health scenario there, lots of opportunities as well. So I advise you to follow her on Twitter. So without further ado, Nicola, I'm really delighted to hand over to you for the inaugural uh, event in, in the RSB DEFRA collaboration on plant health. Uh, uh, and your title, I believe, is the GB Plant Biosecurity Strategy. So over to you, Nicola. Oh, before I go, uh, anybody uh, who's got any questions, we're going to, Nicola won't speak for the full hour. There'll be plenty of time for questions at the end. So please put your questions in chat and I will then uh, spin them to, to, to Nicola at the end. We won't take questions during the presentation. Apologies, Nicola, for that, that diversion. Over to you. Thanks very much, Jerry, and um, thanks very much, everyone, for joining us. Can you hear me OK? <clears throat> yeah, OK, good. So uh, as Jerry has said, um, I'm going to talk about the plant biosecurity strategy. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to. Um, oh, my thing is not working. There we go. Just to rewind a little bit to 2013 when ash dieback was found in the UK. And these were some of the headlines. So it was a very dramatic um, finding and um, the, may, uh, the, the media were very interested as were the public. So it was a really important moment in 
the awareness of plant disease being raised at the highest level. There was even a COBRA meeting about ash dieback uh, and this sense of why didn't we know about it? How, how did we, you know, how did this disease arrive? How are we going to stop things like that, this happening in the future? So as a result, a task force was set up led by government with lots of experts who then advised what do we need to do uh, and really that formed the basis of the first plant biosecurity strategy in 2014. Um, so that was published uh, with a set of very challenging targets and I was actually appointed that same year, I was appointed on the 1st of April 2014 to lead uh, this uh, initiative. But we have seen in recent years um, still a rise in the number of pests and diseases threatening our plants and trees. And the factors uh, you know, are well known really, global trade, pathways for entry, as well as climate change, and you know, the number of pests out there that, that we are aware of. And since we left the EU last year, we have reviewed our plant health regulations, and really rescope them based on risks to GB. So we're no longer looking at, you know, the risks to the um, European uh, community as a whole. Uh, we're able to focus down much more on what are the threats that we're most concerned about. And just to reflect a little bit about some of the things we achieved in that strategy, um, we established the UK Plant Health Risk Register. So this was a world first, really a very comprehensive list of all the pests and diseases that could uh, impact GB uh, with expert um, sort of analysis and pest risk analysis about, you know, the pathway, what, what was the value at risk if these pests became established, um, the economic, social and environmental impacts, as well as what are we going to do about it, how are we going to stop it arriving. So we've made a lot of progress there. We've got more than 1,200 pests on the risk register. So when we launched it in 2014, I think there were around about 600. So um, twice as many pests on our radar with a lot of analysis and understanding about, you know, what are we going to do to stop them arriving and, and what, what do we do if they do? We published a plant health contingency plan in 2016. So that is our high level uh, arrangements for what we do in the event of um, you know, finding a new pest or disease. So that's very much um, a tool that we use regularly um, and we've refined it and tested it over the years. We've had some major public awareness campaigns working with many organisations such as the RSB. Um, we had International Year of Plant Health in 2020 and we launched the first National Plant Health Week last year and we'll be doing the same again this year. We implemented a whole load of plant health legislation whilst we were still in the EU. Uh, and then when we left, we had to deliver all that uh, post-transition uh, legislation to get it onto the UK statute books, review it and so on. So that's been a massive legislative programme. Uh, we also introduced things like civil sanctions so that when there is a breach of biosecurity, we can actually issue uh, a fine quite quickly and easily without the need to go to court. Sometimes we do go to court, uh, but it's very costly, time consuming. So having civil sanctions is quite helpful. And then we've also had various collaborative biosecurity campaigns with APHA around Don't Risk It. And that's about bringing things back from your holidays. And the Forestry Commission Keep It Clean campaign, and that's about biosecurity in woodlands and forests. We've launched lots of online training through our plant health information portal um, for operators, for um, researchers, um, and a whole range of stakeholders. Uh, and we've recently increased the capacity of our plant health services to around 450 inspectors. We used to have about 100 just over a hundred, so it's a massive increase. Um, we developed the information portal to communicate all sorts of plant information uh, to the public, to traders, uh, and to anyone interested in looking at plant health. And then we continue to have 
various um, gardens and exhibitions at things like Chelsea. We'll be at Chelsea again this year. And we've also focused on science and capability. We've worked closely with the Royal Society of Biology and Gatsby on getting plant diseases into syllabuses for schools. It's really, really important to do that because that's where it will start to generate an interest in plant health. We've helped um, develop masters and postgraduate certificate in plant health with Harper Adams. And um, the FUGS program has already been mentioned, the Plant Health Undergraduate Scheme. And this one is open at the moment for researchers to bid. We're really pleased. We started with three um, projects. We're now with collaboration with various other bodies, the BSPP, RSB. Um, we've got nine, I think, on offer this year. We co-invest in research programmes with UKRI and the devolved administrations, and then we can put together much bigger programmes of work, such as the Bacterial Plant Diseases Programme, which is worth 18 million over three years. We've also been investing in the Treescapes Programme, which is led by NERC. Uh, and Action Oak is a pioneering initiative, bringing together lots of partners interested in oak health, to essentially raise more funds. Um, so for example, we've got um, three or four million pounds worth of research going on already with 11 new PhD students um, doing projects on oak health. We published an ASH research strategy and the ASH dieback toolkit, which is as we move towards um, living with ASH in the landscape uh, and developing strategies for making sure that you know, ASH remains an important species. We have a virtual centre for forest protection between Q and forest research, and that's bringing in other partners, uh, other universities such as BIFOR are involved in that. And a couple of weeks ago, we opened a new quarantine laboratory at Alice Holt. So we've been very, very busy this last few years, really driving forward so many initiatives. And why are they important? Well, for example, the risk register, this shows a typical entry for potato ring rot. On the left there, you've got the unmitigated risks of likelihood, spread and impact. They've got maximum values at risk. So this has an unmitigated risk rating of 125, which is the, the maximum it can be. Whereas on the right, through mitigation of things like regulation, surveillance and industry scheme, as well as research and awareness, we can bring that risk rating right down to 40. I mean, it is still a pest of concern, but because we've mitigated, we can actually lower the risk. Uh, and so this is a typical example of the kind of work we do uh, around the risk register. And then also, stronger protection at the borders. We've now got a new border operating model. We have phased in physical inspections. We started them last January. We introduced more this January. Uh, and we can do remote documentary and ID checks as well as physical checks at the borders on nurseries and in the wider environment. We fly helicopters over our treescape to look for changes in the canopy. And then we can hone in on anything that looks of concern. So, you know, a lot of research, surveillance, uh, diagnostic and detection going on. And then we've also been focusing on trades like direct sales, internet trades. And this is just one example of our work where we seize 1,200 consignments of bare-rooted fruit trees. These were all individually boxed to go to individual customers in uh, GB. So they were intercepted because basically they had absolutely no paperwork. There were no phytosanitary certificates, no clear traceability, no passports. Uh, and these are fruit trees, they're high risk. So they were all seized and re-exported. Uh, and then that trader um, you know, needs to comply with um, regulations in future if they want to continue trading. So that was a successful haul. Uh, we're also responding and recovering to a couple of disease outbreaks at the moment, Ips typographus, the spruce bark beetle. I mean, this is where no matter how much action you've got at the border, some pests can simply arrive on the wind. And uh, Ips is a good example. It blows over the channel from France, and then it hits 
any stressed and diseased spruce trees in Kent and Sussex directly in its flight path. So this is under eradication. We've got several findings uh, in the last 12 months, but we are taking action, destroying infested trees uh, and doing a lot of surveillance and modelling to try and work out what can we do to mitigate um, more effectively in the future. And then Phytophthora pluvialis, we found this last October in Western Hemlock in Cornwall. And we're doing a lot of surveillance on this at the moment because we have had several more findings. So again, we're trying to work out where did it come from? How did it get here? Um, what's, the, what's the impact it's going to have? You know, is it going to spread? So we're working collaboratively with New Zealand and the USA as well as across the UK. And then for pests and diseases which are established, we've got various strategies like the Living Ash Project, which has identified uh, tolerant ash trees for future breeding work. Um, and if you think back to the, the crisis in 2013, we really knew nothing about ash or ash dieback. And now, after £6 million of investment, we've got a huge knowledge base. We've got a genome for ash, and we've got really good capability to understand you know, tolerance markers so that we, we can now re-establish ash. I've mentioned the Bacterial Plant Diseases Programme. And then we've been using biological control as well as a strategy for some pests. We released um, the tiny parasitic wasp, Torumus sinensis, to manage the oriental chestnut gall wasp. We released it last year at about 15 sites in Kent, and we're monitoring the effectiveness of that kind of strategy against pests. And of course, there are the ones that we want to keep out, particularly high profile pests such as Xylella, emerald ash borer and plain wilt. So these are some of our highest risks and we're constantly reviewing our measures, investing in research and surveillance so that we can keep these ones out of the UK. So on to our new strategy. So we've been working on this over the last couple of years. Sadly, because of COVID, there's been a lot of delays and we've had other priorities, uh, but um, we launched a consultation on our new strategy last year. And I'll talk to you a little bit about the strategy um, and where we're heading. So we ran a consultation between September and November, and um, it was a GB wide strategy. That's because Northern Ireland works alongside the Republic of Ireland um, on an all island approach because Effectively, the island of Ireland is a single epidemiological unit, but we work closely with Northern Ireland uh, in order to share information. And we had lots of uh, discussions with key stakeholders and also the, um, the round table, the biosecurity round table, which is chaired by Nico Bacon, uh, so that we've got a feel for where do we need to head with our new strategy. And with this also uh, is part of the wider strategic landscape for government. I mean, clearly overarching all of our policies is our net zero target by 2050. Uh, so within that, we've got um, strategies around horticultural growth, tree resilience, food, uh, the 25 year environment plan and biological security, as well as invasive species. So the plant biosecurity Strategy sits at the heart of all these other strategies. They all have to work together so that we can achieve the outcomes that we want. Uh, and essentially, our vision for this new strategy is to protect our plants through strong partnership, working with government, industry, and the public to reduce risks and facilitate safe trade. And we've identified four outcomes uh, that we want to deliver. A world biosecurity, world class biosecurity regime, a society that values healthy plants, a biosecure supply, a plant supply chain, and an enhanced technical capability. So, in the consultation, we ask questions around those um, through a citizen space um, questionnaire. So, at the moment, um, we are um, working on the technical report, which is exactly really what people said about the questions that we asked. We're due to publish this in the next few weeks. Um, and then also 
also part of that was a technical annex on the measures uh, for high risk trees as a sort of separate issue. In all, we received over a thousand responses to our consultation. Um, 145 were on the citizen space consultation, and then there were more than a thousand responses um, as a result of a Woodland Trust letter writing campaign. So all that data has been analysed and we're just uh, finalising the publication of the technical annex. Unfortunately, I can't give you too much detail until that's published. We have to go through a, a process called Right Round. We've got to get other government departments to sign off before we're allowed to publish this. Uh, and then the actual strategy itself um, we'll be hoping to publish in May. So um, this is just one question I will share with you. Which of the following issues do you think poses the greatest risk? So I think this is interesting. Of all of those responses, uh, the majority think that trade imports are the biggest risk. And then we've got all the other risks that you'd expect to see, like climate change, um, personal imports, lack of awareness uh, and knowledge, et cetera. So that's a typical kind of uh, analysis that, that we will publish in the response. And it's interesting that you know trade has that perception of being the greatest risk and and certainly you know that can be true but you know there are various other pathways that are important as well and that's why it's important that in our new strategy we reflect on not just trade but all these other pathways and make sure that we have um mitigations in place to, to really try and tackle all of them so in terms of a world-class biosecurity regime we want to make the most of opportunities that we have to strengthen and tailor our responses to the threats that we face. So that will include a regulatory regime as well as the risk and horizon scanning that results in things like the risk register. And I know, um, you know many universities are also very much engaged in this as well, and we really value and appreciate that work because it's got to be global uh, and it needs to involve you know, our best plant scientists and our best modelers and our best risk analysts so that we can have accurate views uh, of risk and, um, and if anything is changing. And then also outbreak readiness is incredibly important. You know, to begin with, we didn't have a contingency plan. We have that now. We test it regularly. And actually we've got several live outbreaks that I mentioned, which mean that you know, we are using it in anger on a regular basis. So all of these areas, will be uh, developed and strengthened. In terms of a society that values healthy plants, really we look to New Zealand as an exemplar here. They've got around about 4.7 million people who are um, New Zealanders and their strategy that was published a few years ago set out how they wanted every single citizen to be aware of the importance of healthy plants and biosecurity. It's absolutely in their DNA, it's part of their culture. So we set out how can we improve awareness? Uh, you know, what is the baseline for awareness and what do we need to do to encourage good behaviours and responsible behaviours across society, which means that we all take responsibility. So things like awareness raising, education, a professional training, uh, and also using citizen science projects where we can um, get lots of people involved in looking after the health of plants and trees on their patch. So these are all things that we want to develop and we've got very strong support from stakeholders. We're talking about developing a public awareness accord with a whole range of stakeholders and it's really, really positive so far. And then a biosecure plant supply chain. This is really important. We've got to work together to make sure that whether plants are imported or grown in GB, they are biosecure, they're not moving around pests and diseases. We've already developed an initiative called Plant Healthy, uh, but we need to really embed this in the supply chains of our industry and also support domestic production. You know, part of the challenge is reducing imports, increasing domestic productivity, but we know that we're always going to need to import plants and trees. So let's do that in a biosecure way, working throughout the whole supply chain. 
And then fourthly, the enhanced technical capability. This is about making the most of emerging innovative science, technology, keeping pace with changing threats, you know, using tools uh, from different sectors to ensure um, analysis and preparedness for the future. And again, this is about collaboration, particularly with our research institutes, uh, UKRI uh, and other charitable trusts, looking at our research priorities for the future uh, and also how we're going to adopt some of these new and emerging technologies. So that will give you a flavour of, of what you will see um, in the strategy when it's published, where we'll be working on a very detailed plan uh, for delivery. Uh, and again, having lots, doing lots of work with stakeholders over the coming months to develop that detailed delivery plan. So as I say, we'll be publishing the technical report soon and then um, working on public, publishing the final um, strategy Possibly, we hope to coincide with the Chelsea Flower Show. We'll be at Chelsea with a Don't Risk It exhibit, so that will be quite good timing. But again, it, it does, does depend on things like getting um, approval and sign off, etc. So all this information is on the UK Plant Health Information Portal. And as Jerry's already given me a plug for Twitter, um, I will continue in that vein, at Plant Chief, give me a follow. Um, and it'd be great to see you on social media and you'll find out, you know, lots of information about plant health on Twitter. So thank you very much. I will stop sharing. That's it. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Nicola. That, that's fantastic. Uh, dash through what is the scale of the problem and, and some of the solutions that are going into place. I, I erroneously said that we would take the questions in chat but as some of you have found out the questions are, are you should put the questions in q a so we've had a few come in already uh, so i will spin these to to uh, nicola please continue to put them in the chat and i will try and uh, uh, put them out to nicola as appropriate somebody's asked for um, a glossary of acronyms and organizations birmingham university is terrible at acronyms so i'm very sympathetic to that so we'll do that offline and maybe circulate uh, by, by different routes uh, afterwards, uh, it can be really confusing. Uh, and here's a question here, which which doesn't surprise me, and has come up in in different areas. Um, so, uh, and there's a couple of versions of it. So, is the uh, UK safer or less secure um, from plant health threats uh, because of Brexit? Because we've now left the EU. So, there's a couple of people uh, asking that question. Well, I mean, certainly many of the threats we face are in Europe. So being able to have a bespoke a regulatory regime is helpful. So I would say we are better off from a biosecurity perspective. Just an example of that is Xylella. So uh, whilst we were in the EU, we introduced national measures because we didn't think that the EU measures were adequate and were not providing us with enough protection. So, you know, there is clear evidence of xylella fastidiosa being moved in traded plants within the EU. And yet when we brought in stronger measures, we were actually um, told by the European Commission to revoke them because they were not fair. Um, and we had a, a long kind of legal challenge to those measures. Eventually we were forced to revoke them um, just before we left the EU, and then we reintroduced them immediately because we did, we knew that the EU regulations were not adequate. I mean, interestingly, even after we left during the transition period, they were still trying to get us to, to withdraw them, but we refused, and now they've backed down. So I think that's just one example where, you know, within the EU, we simply didn't have adequate measures. Uh, now we do. I mean, there are other examples where we've deregulated certain things. So the EU spend a lot of time uh, worrying about uh, citrus black spot because obviously lots of Mediterranean countries grow citrus. So there were very, very strong controls and uh, prohibitions on citrus. There's been a long running battle with South Africa um, on this um, that's in the WTO. So we looked at citrus pests 
did a full analysis and realized that they presented no threat to GB. So we have deregulated citrus. So I think, you know, we've got a good balance of where we've looked at things where we do need to do more. Uh, and equally, uh, we don't need to inspect citrus or mangoes or a whole load of other fruit and vegetables because we've assessed the risk and we don't think. So all of that benefits industry because uh, it means that, you know, we are uh, taking measures that are proportionate to the risk and reflect, you know, what the value that is at risk and so forth. So, you know, I'm happy that we do have appropriate measures now in place for EU goods as well as goods from the rest of the world. And we didn't didn't have that as much before. Yeah. OK, thanks. Uh, so a related question, really. So when you do the plant health inspections, um, I say at the border, are you specifically looking for symptoms or are you looking for vectors? And a, a sort of subsidiary to that, what about the soil ball pathogens? How do, you, how do you keep an eye on that? So we um, will inspect, we have sort of inspection targets around different commodities uh, based on risk. So for some plants, plants for planting seed potatoes, high risk plants, we have a very high uh, inspection rate. So that might include symptoms. It might include any evidence of, you know, other pests. It might include vectors as well. Uh, you know, certainly for xylella, you know, we do look out for xylella vectors uh, on any traded material uh, because obviously that's a risk as well. So, you know, the inspection regime is absolutely tailored to the commodity, the country of origin, and the, the level of risk inspection. For some soil borne things, we have requirements, you know, that uh, soil is removed from products. We do take uh, samples, we test them, particularly for the potato diseases. I mentioned, you know, ring rot. We have a, a regime whereby we sample potatoes, they're tested in the lab at Ferra, um, and that becomes part of our sampling surveillance and testing regime so that we can be sure uh, that they're not coming in and they're infected. So, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a complex landscape, if you like. You know, we don't, not all inspections are equal. Sometimes we will inspect at ports and borders. Sometimes we'll do that inland at the point of um, destination. And that's because for some plants, they might be dormant, for example, when they're imported. So we will do an in-season inspection. We'll follow up. We'll go and look at those plants when they're in leaf and see if we can see any symptoms, for example. Uh, for other things, we, if we know there's latency, we will test um, you know, once and maybe follow that up later in season again, just in case um, the pathogen becomes detectable. So... Uh, um, and I'm lucky to have a fantastic team of uh, pest risk analysts and economists, statisticians, uh, people with expertise around policy and science and anal analysis to help us, you know, develop the kind of fit for purpose regime that's then implemented by the inspectors in APHA. Uh, and, you know, we do review it based on real data. You know, we, we gather interception data in fact, since we started inspecting EU material, um, we've um, detected more than 100 quarantine pests, more than 300 instances of other non-compliance, and that is on EU material. As you know, for the rest of the world, we're looking at, you know, around about 1,500 interceptions every year at our ports and borders. So. You know, it, it is, that's why we need a lot more inspectors. And, and luckily we've recruited some fantastic inspectors. Okay, uh, so another related question, a uh, good question's coming in. Uh, so, so okay, you talked about the borders there and, uh, and inspection at the borders and so on. But what about the, the, the ones that get in under the radar, say orders through the internet and uh, you know, where, where mm. it's just a postman? Yeah, so we have an internet trade unit based in APHA. So these are uh, a group of uh, inspectors who specialize in, um, you know, essentially intelligence gathering. They do visits to the, the Coventry 
um, parcel depot to Langley to all the different couriers, depots. Uh, we work with Border Force. You know, we, we use a range of surveillance techniques as well as working with internet sales platforms. Um, they search for keywords that we give them around prohibited trades. If they find them, they take them down. So there's a whole range of different things that we do, but clearly we have to, you know, be constantly vigilant. It's also about raising awareness with traders so that they know they can't send a fruit tree in the post with no phytosanitary certificate. Um, and also the public, you know, they buy these things in good faith, possibly assuming that because they're for sale on the internet, they must be fine and legal and raising awareness so that they, when they think, oh, I'm going to buy a fruit tree and they think, oh, well, I'd better check that, you know, the country of origin is, is actually complying with biosecurity or that the, the company who's acting as the kind of courier knows, knows about the regulations. It's, it's kind of everybody taking responsibility for that. I mean, we had an incident a couple of years ago where unsolicited, unsolicited seed was sent by post all over the world. We had thousands of packages came to the UK um, and we had a big media campaign. We asked people to send them to us. We analysed them. I think we had about more than 6,000 packets were returned to us, um, to APHA and Farrah did all the analysis for us. And actually there was no major biosecurity risk, but it just shows because these packets came in marked earrings and, you know, jewellery and they were low value, small packages, you know, they were able to come into the system. Um, thankfully, that hasn't happened again. But um, yeah, we do have to be very vigilant. Mm. And, and, and what somebody's asking here, so the strategy, so we got, you mentioned the Chelsea Flower Show and, and so on. How do you influence or, or include, including your strategy, reducing the number of imported plants? Or is it more about clean alien plants? Well, it's both really. Um, for some very high risk plants, I mean, some plants are, are simply prohibited. You can't bring them in anyway. So things like ACEs from, from China, other parts of Asia, they are completely prohibited. We do have a derogation for bonsai because they can be quarantined and observed uh, over time. So, you know, for some high risk plants from certain parts of the world, they are prohibited. Other trades then, um, you know, we, we are a nation of garden lovers. I mean, since lockdown, it's been estimated that there are another 3 million gardeners, which means I think around about 30 million of the population, half the population of uh, the UK, um, like gardens and plants, which is great because we know plants are so important for health and well-being and exercise and the environment, of course, and nature and biodiversity. So how do we get the balance right between we will always want to import um, and some traded plants and actually there's some that we can grow. So we're trying to support, you know, secure, biosecure supply chains if we import and also incentives, investment uh, for homegrown production as well, if that can happen. And, you know, we, we have seen a reduction uh, in the overall mass of imported trees over the last few years. I mean, actually, the value has increased, which is interesting. So there are, there are fewer imports, but they're higher value, which perhaps suggests that, you know, there are higher costs associated with imported plants because of inspection and regulation and uh, you know, some of these uh, additional requirements that, that are necessary, it does add cost. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, you mentioned the citizen science side of things with the, with the, with the New Zealand example and, and the rise of gardeners in this country. Um, if you told people to behave because there was a, a variant of COVID coming in, from another country, um, somebody's referred to that in one of the questions, then, then we would, you would be able to persuade people that, that there was good stuff. But if, if it's a plant, all since Victorian times, we, we like plants that are alien, don't we? Uh, I mean, that, do, you, do you see people's perceptions being different to plants than, than other organisms? Yeah, I think some people perhaps don't realise that plants get sick as well. I mean, I think ash dieback was an important moment and, and Dutch elm disease before it in realising that 
pests and diseases can have a landscape impact. Um, so I think we are slowly getting the message through. We need to do more. I mean, it'd be great to hear from other people, you know, their ideas for, you know, trying to get, uh, you know, more awareness and more responsibility. Um, and, you know, we work with a number of organisations, the RHS and uh, the Horticultural Trades Association, etc. cetera. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think we've still got quite a long way to go. I mean, clearly COVID has made, you know, everybody aware of the, the global threat of a disease which emerges thousands of miles away and how it can impact all of us. Um, you know, I think in other parts of the world, in, in um, African countries, you know, you see um, devastating impacts of some plant diseases like cassava, mosaic virus, for example, you know, maize street virus. Um, some of these diseases that impact staple food crops um, you know, we're better at managing that um, uh, in, in the UK and in Europe. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, resistance can develop, you know, new strains can appear, and that can have real impacts on food security that, that certainly, you know, mean that there's, there's greater awareness. I mean, we do like to work with the gardening programmes and the radio shows to try and get the message out. Uh, but I think we've still got quite a long way to go. Yes, yes, I remember you telling Monty John off. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we were a bit so, disappointed that Monty was promoting olive trees on Gardens World. So um, um, he was actually very gracious and said, yes, he would have, have a program about biosecurity to kind of uh, raise the awareness. And that really helps because, um, you know, people listen to these kind of public figures and, and their voice can often be quite powerful. I know that um, the uh, Bridget team, the Xylella project, managed to get Helen Mirren to do a voiceover on one of their animations. And we've actually got Judy Dench as one of our champions for Action Oak. Uh, so, you know, trying to get different people involved and also younger voices, you know, and that's why social media is important, you know, getting kind of younger voices um, people that are passionate about plants, you know, we get the next generation thinking, okay, yeah, well, I didn't realise, and you know, I'll be more careful about where I get my plants from. Yeah, yeah, well, that, that leads me on to, to another pair of questions that I can I can stick together on, on the education, which which actually leads nicely in. So, so do, there's somebody there asking for uh, citizen science projects that we could uh, develop for secondary schools. Are there any examples of that? And then a little bit further down the line, somebody's asking for are there any graduate opportunities or internships within De DEFRA or other things um, uh, uh, yeah. as well? Now, obviously, we've got the FUGS, obviously, but uh, so yeah. two related questions about education there. Um, yes, yeah, so on citizen science, so we support a project called Observer Tree, which is, is managed by Forest Research and the Woodland Trust, and they train 200 volunteers to spot, I think, around about 25 tree pests and diseases, and basically they get lots of training and support, and then they go out on their patch and look out for these and provide reports either you know, negative reports if the tree's healthy or a positive sighting. So this project's been going five years, I think. We've just agreed to fund the next phase. They're just training up um, the next kind of 100 volunteers. Um, so that's a really good project. And it's the sort of thing that could be done at a local level, actually. You know, a local wildlife group could get together and say, well, we're worried about, you know, the ash, the oak, whatever, you know, let's start um, you know making observation it's a bit like the rspb uh, bird watch you know everyone watches their garden for one hour on a designated day and you tell us you know what do you see so you know we're trying to get that observational uh, element there was a really good citizen science project for um one of the i think it was for the, for the bridget project which is one of the xylella projects called the spittlebug hunt and um, that was essentially asking anyone anywhere in the UK to look out for spittle bugs. So you, you might know spittle bugs as is cuckoo spit. It's where you've got a plant with a kind of white bubbly stuff. 
um, that looks a bit like spit, spittle, and that's a sign that you've got a spittle bug. And that project was able to, I think there were about 6,000 reports. They were able to map um, where, and I think you were asked to say what species the plant was as well. So they were able to map the species and the distribution, which then helps when you're looking at, you know, a xylella outbreak and, you know, where are the spittle bugs, which are the vectors, of course, of xylella. So those are good examples. But again, it'd be great to hear about, you know, any other ideas people have for citizen science. In terms of internships, we, we provide quite a few different opportunities. Uh, for example, for PhD students, um, normally they will do a three month placement as part of their PhD. So we've hosted quite a few students for that. We've got one at the moment, uh, Lucas Steele, who's from Rothamsted. She's working um, in my policy team. And then we've got another student, uh, Amy Tonks. She's from Harper Adams. She's going to be working with the inspectorate for three months. Um, I had another student from Nottingham a few years ago. She came to uh, do a placement in a, in a policy role. And in fact, she's now come back. She now works for us, um, Jasmine Burhersey. So she um, started working deaf for about a year ago and she's now in our tree health policy team. So, you know, there are opportunities. I would encourage you, you know, send me a DM, um, you know, say what you're interested in. I can then ask my colleagues and, and see if we can find something suitable because for us, it means, you know, extra help and expertise. It means, you know, new ideas. And it also means, you know, we might be able to employ you in the future or you know, we're helping develop the career of someone that might go on to work in research or, or um, you know, uh, in, in commerce or, or in, in business or government. So to me, that's always a, a positive. So the, the, uh, as well as the formal schemes, and there are formal internship schemes across all government departments, uh, as well as the fast stream uh, recruitment. So, you know, have a look out for those on civil service jobs and on the kind of government websites, because there are quite a lot of opportunities and different schemes specifically aimed um, at different sort of pathways for entry. Okay, thanks. So uh, get in touch with uh, uh, fill up her DM box and follow her on Twitter. <laughs> Not too many DMs, please. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, um, a couple of uh, questions which I think we can squash together. So, so going back really to um, to, to uh, looking at imports. So, it, do we publish the data on imports from country of origin, and and uh, you know, do, do we see who's on the naughty step? And, and a mm. sort of related question, I suppose. Um, if they've got a phytosanitary certificate, can they be forged easily? And is that mm. a problem? Yeah, no, all really good questions. So yes, we do publish the data. So when we were in the EU, this data was gathered centrally uh, and was published by Sante F, which is the kind of audit bit of the commission. So we've now started gathering this data independently. We publish it on the plant health portal um, and yes, it absolutely allows you to see which commodities, which countries of origin, there is a problem. Um, and of course, um, you know, that is that will mean that we will want to intensify inspections on that material. It also means that the country uh, where the pest has originated can also look at their trade. Uh, and in fact, whenever we have um, a finding or a non-compliance, we will tell that country directly. So, um, you know, if someone in my office will contact them and say, we found pest X on this commodity from this supplier, um, you know, can you explain what's going on? So that they've got the opportunity then to also investigate. Because by doing that and being open, um, you know, we can all help improve standards um, so and also if, if we've had a non-compliance of any exports from GB we will similarly get a notification um, and we will realize you know that there might be a problem and we'll work with that supplier that grower to kind of investigate because we you know none of us want to be um, you know responsible for moving any kind of pest or disease problem 
So it works both ways. Um, sorry, what was the other part of that question? Uh, it, can you forge the biosecurity certificates? And oh, is that, that an fighters. issue? So phytosanitary certificates, they're, they're not just bits of paper. They have a watermark. They're difficult to forge because they, um, it's a bit like a banknote. They've got a signature embedded in it that is difficult to forge. During COVID, there was a global move to move away from physical phytosanitary certificates to, to you know, photocopies, faxes, emails. Um, so, but that was simply because the pandemic meant that it wasn't feasible to issue hard copies. So uh, it's something that we do look out for. We always do 100% document and identity checks on phytos, we can spot a forged one. And we work again with countries of origin where there is a problem. We'll go back to the, um, the National Plant Protection Organization and say, look, we think this one's forged, can you investigate? Sometimes countries will come to us and say, we've got a problem with a few suppliers. We know that there are some forgeries. Will you, you know, here's a list of the authorized suppliers. If you get a phyto from anybody else, let us know because that's likely to be fraudulent. So we work together quite closely. We're also moving to electronic um, certification. So again, that will help reduce that risk uh, of a paper phyto, a hard copy phyto being forged because it will be, there'll be an electronic um, document and signature. Okay, yeah, so uh, we've got, We've only got a few minutes left, so I'll, I'll give you a couple of questions that perhaps we'll finish with. But uh, one, one focusing at, 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 on that question. At, at, so, so do do you think that for allotment holders or gardeners that that that, that phytosecurity certificates and plant passports and so on are going to be uh, necessary, or is that is that something that that's too far away from reality? I mean, really, our approach is unless you're a professional operator. Unless you are trading, you know, regularly plants for profit, then, you know, you're outside the scope of these regulations. So if you're, you know, got an allotment or a local garden club or you're going to sell a few plants at the, the, the village fete um, for charity, then, you know, we, we're not um, expecting, you know, phytosanitary regulations. Um, and again, there's quite good <laughs> guidance about this. We do get asked, you know, people want to do the right thing. They don't want to do the wrong thing. So there's good guidance about that. But obviously, you know, we want to be pragmatic. Um, we want to encourage people to have allotments and, and um, you know, have gardening clubs and things like that. And, and that sort of informal sharing is outside the scope of our plant health regulations. Okay, thanks, Nicola. That's reassuring to me as a gardener. Uh, anyway, so uh, you won't be knocking on my door asking for my plant certificate. <laughs> if, however, you start importing things and uh, planting them and distributing them, then we'll be interested. <laughs> I'll promise not to. Uh, so, so going to the other end of the scale, and I think this will be the final question. Um, I think we've got lots of questions that are really interesting and we weren't able to answer. So we'll collate those and, and, and maybe uh, um, send those to Nicola in case there's anything she, she'd like to pick up or we can pick it up in a future meeting. Uh, but, but going to the other end of the, of the, of the professionals, uh, you know, so stakeholders in the horticultural section are going to have to change their behaviours to comply with some of this, with the, you know, including green waste management, which is uh, something that the questioner makes the point. So are the plans for financial support or incentive for these stakeholders to adopt them? Is it, is it, is it just a stick or is there a carrot somewhere as well? Not an imported um, carrot, obviously. Well, we do provide um, a range of support for different scenarios. So for example, you know, if you're a landowner and you get a tree pest like ips typographers in your spruce we we have um now a pilot scheme of grants whereby you can fell and um you know safely remove and manage that infested waste and you will get funding to restock with a more suitable species um so you know so things like the kind of managing disease, 
selling restocking costs. Um, you know, we do have grants for that. Um, we do have support for, um, you know, nurseries to invest in production and, and innovation particularly. We just launched the second call for a tree innovation fund where we want, um, you know, businesses or partnerships to come forward and say, actually, you know, we've got a, a better, more biosecure way of producing large numbers of tree seedlings that we need to meet our tree planting targets and our net zero and biodiversity challenges. So, you know, we, we do have a range of support available uh, to incentivize, um, you know, better biosecurity behavior and also, um, you know, UK production and, and managing some of these problems. Uh, you know, we have, we've had grants in the past for removal of rhododendron ponticum, for example, because that is a vector for Phytophthora morum, which then has an impact on tree species like larch. So, you know, grants were available to remove that and dispose of that as a way of managing, um, you know, tree health and tree resilience. Okay, uh, I think that's a positive note to end on. We, we, we're nearly at two o'clock. Uh, I'd like to thank Nicola uh, for, for an enthralling presentation. You can see how uh, how, how engaging it's been by the number of questions that we've had, a lot of which we haven't been able to answer because we've, we've run out of time. Um, uh, so please, uh, if uh, Eleanor is going to put a link in the chat, um, which will be give us any feedback about, about the event, either the format or the content. And as I say, we've got future one of these coming up. There's a main event in Birmingham and then there'll be two more after that this year and then it will cycle on for a number of years. So, so keep an eye on it. I, I'm really pleased to say, um, both with the engagement of the audience, also the size of the audience. We, we had nearly 200 people uh, in the room at the start. Um, I, um, so, so thanks for that. Uh, so I'd just like to, to thank Nicola once again for your time and um, look forward to, to you guarding our shores uh, more closely in the future. Uh, uh, thank you very much, Nicola. And I'm sure everyone will agree in, in, in sharing your, our thanks to you.